got lots of good people on this on this task. And uh, um, you know, uh, I, I have to say that uh, you know, working with Lisa Stevens, who's the CEO of Paizo, um, it's it's a great working relationship because the two of us worked together at Wizards of the Coast when the Open Gaming license was created. So um, you know, we have this kind of unique team in that the people that are working on this thing probably know that system better than anybody else in the world, um, which is why we have, you know, the confidence that we can make it work. All right. Speaking of development, one of the things that I've noticed as well is the hexes. You kind of talk, you refer to them in a lot of the blog posts. I do actually have a screenshot of a developed hex, which, you know, I scraped off the blog. And yeah. uh, can you kind of talk about how the hexes are important. I, you've talked about like monster level density, I believe, in certain hexes. Yeah. I mean, what's behind the hex? What is the hex and why is it important to us? Okay, so um, yeah, hexes. Well, we're old school at Pathfinder Online. <laughs> we're yeah. using hexes. I got some okay, hex maps so, from some Greyhawk campaigns yeah, sitting absolutely. around. Yeah. So, you know, one of the design objectives that we had from the very beginning of the project was that we wanted to have a single server that was a seamless world. Um, we think that one of the things that makes uh, the first M, the massively M, in massively multiplayer online game, uh, really meaningful is having uh, as many different people in the same shared world as possible. And while the industry kind of went down the direction of doing servers that are clones of one another, um, you know, we kind of like to go the opposite direction and, and try to have one really big server. So that's our design goal, and uh, and making that that design goal work implies that we have to create a huge amount of territory. So in a more uh, in a more traditional MMO, you know there would be zones. The zones would be carefully handcrafted by the art team and the game design team, and you would just replicate the zone in every server that you replicated. If you had a thousand servers, you have a thousand copies of that zone. But if we have one server that all the people are playing in, we don't want to just copy one part of the terrain a thousand times. That would get really boring and it would not make a lot of logical sense. So early on in the development, we came up with this idea of saying that we should think logically about the game's territory as if it was hexes in an old-fashioned you know, map that you would get in the 80s when you opened a Greyhawk supplement. And we could scope the effort required to build our territory to the level of the hex, figure out how much work it required to make a hex, and then that would allow us to estimate how much it would cost and how long it would take to make a lot of hexes to make a very large game space. Uh, and also, we knew from the beginning that we wouldn't have to make all the hexes at the beginning. So um, if, we make, if we did a traditional theme park style world, we'd have to build almost all the territory before we could release it to the players. But by building a game where there's only going to be one world and we don't have to have zones, we can plan to just add more hexes over time as the population of the game grows. So we imagine that at some point in the future, we'll have a gigantic territory in Pathfinder Online, but we won't have to make all that territory at the beginning. We can just make it as we go, and as the population grows, we can just add more space. And thinking about hexes in that sense makes a lot of sense as well. We can look at population density per hex. We can look at the population density of the server. We can look at certain places that maybe are getting overpopulated or underpopulated and think about where we want to add more hexes to the map, to the edge of the map, and how we want to add them in such a way as to get people to voluntarily relocate because they're pursuing, you know, interesting harvesting opportunities or different kinds of territory that they might want to be a, you know, have access to or whatever, right? It gives us a, a, a lot of knobs we can twist to kind of affect people's uh, play patterns without telling them what to do. We can just give them incentives and then they'll do it because they're following the incentives. Okay, so we have this idea of a hex. Well, we don't just want to have a generic hex, just like one generic hex you just replicate a million times. There needs to be some game design ideas behind what goes into a hex. And so uh, Lee Hammock, who's our lead designer, he and his team have been working on the idea that there are types of hexes, and the different types of hexes are, are atomic. So if we say that a, a hex is a monster hex, that means a certain thing from the game design standpoint about the kinds of encounters that you might find in it and the kinds of resources you might find in it. And it also creates some self-imposed limitations. So we're not going to put certain kinds of structures into a monster hex because the monsters would tear them down. 
you might find ruins there artistically because that's cool, but we're not going to tell the players that a monster hex is a place where they could go and, and build a settlement. Um, contrary to that, we might have a settlement hex, which is a hex that's designed to have a settlement in it. Settlements are one of the focuses of our game design, and the idea is that the players collectively as a group will be able to build, uh, they, they're essentially little walled cities. And uh, over time, they become more complicated and they, they develop um, their own little unique characters and, and their own uh, unique you know, visual appearance. Um, but they're, they're relatively big compared to the size of a hex in our, in our current design. So you ha we have to have the geography of the hex built in such a way to have a place to put one of these little walled cities. It's got to be a big flat place where you can build the thing. Um, so we have those two ideas, monster hexes and, and settlement hexes, and then that led naturally to uh, the development of a couple of other kinds of hexes. So there's like a farmland hex, uh, there's a wilderness hex, which is um, kind of undefined, but it's designed to be um, a lawless region where there's not too many monsters, but some monsters, and there's no settlements, but there might be a lot of people there. There's Badlands hexes, which are probably going to be relatively resource intensive, but um, there'll be, uh, there's not a lot of cover, there's not a lot of trees, so you'll be able to see a fairly long distance in them, and that will make uh, an interesting PvP experience. If you're in there trying to harvest resources, it'll be perhaps easier for your competitors to see what you're doing and come try to stop you. Um, so anyway, so we have this kind of menu of, of hex types. So. Uh, the game design team sat down with the map of the area that we're going to be building out uh, in the initial release for early enrollment, and they've overlaid a hex grid on it, and then they assigned various types of hexes to all that space. Um, so now the art team knows like how many assets they have to produce and how they, uh, you know, how, how much territory has to be generated, and uh, that all feeds back into a process where they estimate, you know, time and personnel cost, so we can make some sanity checks about whether we can actually do what we think we're trying to do. Um, and a lot of that is the stuff that was happening in the first couple of milestones. Um, now we have done, uh, as you've seen for the Q4 uh, milestone, we have, um, I think it's a six by six hex area, maybe it's four by six, anyway, it's several hexes. Uh, we, we built them all in our tool uh, system, so uh, we use a, uh, a really neat piece of software called Grome which allows us to do some procedurally generated terrain so the artists don't have to go in and like handcraft every you know, nook and cranny. Uh, we've got some different types of hexes so we could test out those various systems. And, and it's all integrated and running on our server now. So now we've got a real world you know, sense of, of can we do this or not? And the answer is yes, we, we can do it. We, we think the system's gonna work. Um, I think that telling people about hexes uh, helps them also understand how they'll interact with the game environment. You know, in a game with no zones, when we know we have a large population of people who are going to come in and say, you know, well, tell me about, you know, how, how do I know what to do? If there's no, if there's no obvious, like, scripted PvE theme park thing, what, what do I do? Um, you know, we can say, oh, well, okay, here's what you do. You, you find a settlement hex and there'll be a settlement there. Um, you, you become friends with them and, and uh, you know, you engage socially and, um, Maybe they need people to gather resources or fight monsters or guard the, the entrances or whatever. Uh, and you'll be able to find a, a role for yourself and, and, and you and your friends can, can you know, get, get together and do cool things. Um, and, you know, you'll go to the monster hexes to kill monsters and you'll go to the badlands hexes to get resources. And you'll travel through wilderness hexes as you move from place to place and you'll have to be worried that there might be bandits there. So it creates some framework uh, for people to understand kind of how to play the game. Uh, again, not without like telling them how to play, but just providing um, some incentives and some framework structures that they can then take and and emergently create a cool experience. I agree. I agree. One of the more divisive, more divisive. top. Sorry, I was feeding back there for you. One of the more divisive topics that we talked about actually a year ago was PvP, and at the time you knew it was going to be in the game, but you guys weren't exactly sure how it was going to pan out. Uh, a couple months ago, you guys put a pretty, not you, but one of your team members, put a pretty in-depth blog post about how PvP was going to play out and the impact it was going to have. Because it's one of those very social, interactive things. I mean, what's more you know, interactive than shanking somebody, you know? Um, <laughs> that needs to be in the game. I mean, it just it has to be in this type of game. So how did you guys end up implementing it? And... Um, how can people 
you, know, you were talking about you know, going up to the settlement hex. How did you guys implement it, and how are you going to keep it from becoming like you know, the next Daisy, where people are just out there in the woods waiting to jump on you know, the noobs? Yep, absolutely. Uh, okay, so you, you've done a fantastic job of problem definition. <laughs> right? These are, yeah, it's a problem. These are well understood uh, dysfunctional behaviors that happen in games that have a lot of PvP. Okay, so one of the things I tell people all the time is that uh, I like to make the analogy to American football. Uh, like, American football is not a game about tackling, even though there's tackling that happens on every single play, and tackling can be the difference between winning and losing. It's not a game about tackling. It's a game about passing and running and defense and scoring touchdowns and field goals and all the stuff that goes into an American football game. Some of those guys really need to learn how to tackle. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There are some <laughs> specialized tacklers, yeah, absolutely, uh, who are critical to the success of the team, right? So uh, Pathfinder Online is going to be a game that has PvP in it, but it is not a PvP game. It is not a game about PvP in the same way that American football is not a game about tackling. Tackling's important to it, and it happens all the time, and it infuses the whole game with a certain sense of how it's played, but that's not the point. That's just one of the things you do when you play American football. So, um, in my opinion, there is, uh, there is a huge opportunity to make PvP and PvP experiences as interesting and engaging and as uh, fun, although fun is a tough word to define, um, as the other kinds of things that people are doing in MMOs every day today. The crafting and the questing and the socializing. So, um, I feel like uh, if we are successful in finding ways to kind of return PvP to its rightful place among the many things that you do in an MMO, um, that will will add a lot of value and, and a lot of players will find an experience in Pathfinder Online that is really engaging and really deeply immersive um, in a way that they may not be able to get in a, in a more traditional theme park style MMO where PvP, if it exists, is kind of in a walled garden and it's optional. So, um, you know, the, the big issue that we've got is that there, there is a certain sociopathic element in society uh, who enjoys the infliction of pain and suffering on others. So we'll call them griefers for the sake of argument. And griefing play in MMOs uh, is degenerate. It leads to a condition where people who don't like it leave, and pretty soon the only people that are left in the game are the people who enjoy making other people miserable, which if you think about it is a pretty awful place to spend your time. So we need to create systems and we need to create a community which is resistant to that degenerate behavior. Uh, we need to create a way for people to engage in PvP in a way that does not lead inexorably to uh, everybody who doesn't want to get involved in it feeling like the game sucks and leaving. And that's a pretty tall order. Um, and I don't believe that we necessarily have solved the problem. I think we have some ideas about solutions and we're going to try them. And I'm not going to be surprised if we don't get it right on the first try and we have to keep innovating. Um, but uh, I do believe that we have some inkling of how to solve the problem and that we're going, to be, uh, we're going to be ahead of the curve when we begin as opposed to behind the curve. So the biggest thing that I would say is that I don't think there's a magic bullet. I don't think there's a rule or a mechanic or, or any one thing that you just flip a switch and the problem goes away. I think that what has to happen is you have to take a multi-layered approach. And you have to focus on the people, not the, not the game mechanic. PvP is not the problem. People who are jerks are the problem. So what we need to do is we need to do a good job in the context of our game of defining what being a jerk means in a way that's understandable to everybody who wants to play it. And in having game systems that penalize you when you're a jerk. And a community that is resistant to jerk-like behavior. A community that does a good job of self-policing and a good job of telling people, hey, uh, you know, that was, that's not cool. Don't do that. Um, you know, we'd love to have you here. We want you to be a part of our community. And if you want to stay, you know, that's behavior that we don't tolerate. We don't want you to do that. Uh, you know, I tell people all the time that, uh, you know, I play a lot of poker. I love playing poker. And it's a really aggressive game. And, you know, there's money on the line. And people's tempers get really heated. And, 
you know, it's, it's, a, it's a high intensity experience if you play it uh, at certain levels. Yet, even with